Am I crazy? Am I mad? I I'm afraid so. You're bonkers. You've lost your mind. But I'll tell you a secret. All the best people are. What's up, my crazy church? What's up, Church by the Glaze? Good to see you today. Glad you're here. If you're with us for the first time or watching on television, watching online, we're doing a, a, a series based on movies, Family Drive-In, using movies to segue to biblical teaching. And uh, that question of crazy that shows up, not just in the Tim Burton film, but throughout the story of Alice in Wonderland is an interesting theme. But I do like where that question kind of lands about you know, all the best people are. Because I, I, I like talking about the best. In fact, I strive to be the best I can possibly be. I mean, I want to be the best husband I can possibly be. I want to be the best father. I want to be the best, best pastor. I mean, I want to be the best, not relative to someone else. But I want to find and fulfill the fullness of my God-given potential. I think we should strive to be the best. Amen? Amen? Amen. We should be the best. Just try to be the best you can possibly be at all times. Fulfill your God-given calling. The best. In fact, I like talking about the best. I like to make lists of the best, you know, this or that. I'm a sports fan, so I love talking to those sports fans about, you know, who, who are the best all-time left-handed hitters? Or who are the best quarterbacks of the 1980s, right? And you go through the list of the best, like, uh, number one, Elway. No, number one, Marino, then Elway, then maybe Montana, the best of the historians. Uh, who are the best United States presidents with beards, with beards? Number one would be... Abraham Lincoln, number two, would be, eh, it gets kind of hard, doesn't it? Number two, most of the good presidents that have beards. I, I don't know, uh, Grant, Garfield, no, Rutherford B. Hayes of Ohio. Yeah, okay, bad list, bad list. Uh, any movie fans in the house, put your hands together if you like a good flick, you like a good movie. You know, the best movies, you can go online and find a series of, uh, of experts that would share, you know, what they think are the best movies of all time. I found a list by AMC American Movie Classics Network, and at their panel used criteria of uh, critical acclaim, Academy Award nomina nominations or wins, uh, popularity during the day it was released, and then staying power. Now, some movies have endured over the course of time. They're still relevant. They're still entertaining. Here are their top five. Top five, best, best. When I say three, shout the word best. Ready? One, two, three. Best movies of all time, according to AMC, uh, number five. Number five, Shawshank Redemption. Great movie, a little rough, kind of raw, but great movie. It is a redemptive flick. Uh, number four, The Godfather. The Godfather, yeah, great movie. Brando in that, Pacino in that, you know, great storytelling. Number three, talk about one that's endured from 1939, The Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz. Any, any fans of The Wizard of Oz? Y'all being kind of quiet here at 1130. Uh, number two, Humphrey Bogart, Casablanca. Now, if you've not taken the time to watch an old black and white movie, this is a great one. It moves. The storyline is, is great. The acting superb. Then they said the number one, the best movie of all time, also from 1939, Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind. It was three and a half hours long, but it was actually seen by more Americans in theaters than any other movie far and away. It is a great movie. The best, the best. We can make lists of the best athletes, the best politicians, the best movies. But how about this? How about this? Let's, let's really go for a big one. The best person. Who, who is the greatest human being ever? And you're like, uh, let me say Jesus, because I'm in church, and I'm going to guess Jesus is probably the right answer, like 90% of the time, I'm going to go with Jesus, and that would be the right answer, but that's not really fair, because though Jesus was fully human, he is also fully God, so we'll leave Jesus out of the discussion. Who is the greatest human being ever, excluding Jesus, or <laughs> excluding Jesus, and you're like, well, how in the world do I answer that one? I mean, that's so broad. There have been so many great and impactful people in the history of the human family, I mean, shucks, if you're here at one of our campuses and you're a senior adult, just during the course of your lifetime, so many great, you know, awesome people, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, Mother Teresa, uh, you know, Gandhi perhaps is still alive when you were alive, uh, uh, Billy Graham, think about the life and legacy of the 97-year-old Billy Graham has preached the gospel to more people than anyone else, in the, the greatest ever? Like, David, there's no way, man. We can never come up with a list of the best or the greatest human beings ever. 
Well, actually, someone weighed in on the topic that I really respect his opinion. Jesus provides in the Bible a very short list of the greatest ever. Really? I'm going to show you. You take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew, look at you guys doing worship in the car, scars, studying the Bible in a red GTO. That's kind of fun. Matthew chapter 3 is our primary text. Hey, all campuses, all cam we're one church in many locations right now. Let's shout that out together. Matthew chapter. Three. Come on, Matthew chapter. Three. We'll be to that, be in this account in just a moment. But before we get there, let me show you something Jesus said. Jesus spoke about who was the best ever, greatest ever. Big idea today is the idea of best. And in Luke's gospel, you say in Matthew 3, Luke's gospel chapter 7, look what Jesus says in verse 28. In verse 28, he says, I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one, no, come on guys, there is no one than this guy named John. Wow. Wow, isn't that kind of crazy? Jesus said this one guy, John, was so crazy impactful, so crazy purposeful, so crazy persistent, so crazy successful. Of all people born, the best, the greatest. Look, I want to be the best, not the best pastor compared to other pastors. I want our church to be the best church, not compared to other churches, but the best that we can possibly be to find and fulfill the fullness of your God-given potential, to be the best you you can possibly be. How, how does that happen? How, what can I learn from this guy, John? Because Jesus said he was the best. Well, if you don't know who John is, I'll give you the brief Wikipedia on John. Uh, John is the forerunner of the Christ. You see, there have been a God gap about 400 years when God had not spoken a word of divine revelation. From the conclusion of the Old Testament to the start of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there had not been a prophetic word. But God raises up this dude named John, and he is God's spokesperson. He's preparing the way for the coming Messiah. He preaches the good news, the Bible says, and a message of something called repentance. What is repentance? Remember last week, Transformers? Remember last week? Come on, we had giant 14-foot-tall robots in church last week. Repentance is a decision you make. If maybe you're going the wrong direction, maybe you're going away from God, you kind of come to your senses and you make a U-turn, that's repentance, and you turn back towards God and God can bless that decision. So John was preaching that and then he was baptizing people. In fact, they had a nickname. They called him John the Baptizer. John the Baptizer. He was baptizing people. And someone stopped him right there and go, yeah, you guys at CBG, you do that, right? You do that full immersion Baptism, it's, that's kind of crazy, you know, just being honest, don't be going to offend you, but that's a little extreme. You know, you, you fully immerse full-grown people in front of other full-grown people. Where'd you get that idea from? The Bible. That's the way they baptized in the Scripture. And John, as a symbol of that repentance, of that turn to God by faith, he's immersing people, and so that's where we get it from. In fact, we have a beach baptism, and if you've trusted Christ, your next step is baptism. And you're like, no, that's crazy. Not doing that, because just, just truth be told, it feels kind of weird, awkward, a little undignified. I'm a full-grown man to get fully immersed in front of other full-grown people. I don't think I can do that. And listen, I understand it. I, I get it. In fact, I agree with you, except for a couple things I find in the Bible. Number one, baptism is something Christ commanded. Great commission, the only specific step of obedience he commands is baptism. So our king commands his followers to identify with him as, as being baptized. And then number two, I know you're all cool and you're all dignified, but Jesus himself was baptized by John. I know you're cool, but you're not as cool as Jesus, amen? Turn to your neighbor and say, you are cool, but you are not as cool as Jesus. Go ahead. You're very, very cool, but not as cool. And if Jesus who was fully man but also fully God, God incarnate, worthy of all glory and praise and worship, God undignified, got himself baptized. You should get baptized at the beach in two weeks. So John's baptizing. But I'm not really here to talk about baptism. I'm here talking about being effective, being so crazy successful, being so crazy impactful that Jesus says the best, best ever, greatest person ever. So how can I maximize my opportunity and God-given potential. I, I would say a couple ideas. you find these in the Scripture. Number one, it would be the best you can be. I would say this. Be balanced. Be balanced. I mean, strive to be balanced emotionally, 
tries to be balanced mentally, spiritually, try to balance out uh, obligations and allocation of time, establish proper priorities. You need to be balanced. Church by the Glades, all campuses, when I shout three, you shout the word balanced. One, two, three. You need to be balanced. Look what it says in Proverbs. You stay in Matthew chapter three, but in Proverbs 14 it says, a sound mind makes for a robust body. A sound balanced mind makes for a robust body, but runaway or unbalanced emotions corrode the bones. You need to be balanced. See, the more balanced I am, the more stress I can shoulder. See if that relates. Anybody here got a little stress in your life today on the Sunday morning? A little stress, a little financial stress, relational stress. Got, you know, boss bringing down, got deadlines, got already got exams in school. Raise your hand. Anybody got a little stress? Yeah, if you're breathing, you got stress. <laughs> to shoulder stress, if I'm balanced, I manage it better. Uh, by the way, it's not shouldering stress. Also, you can bear more blessing. Are, are you with me? Balance? We're talking about being a mentally balanced, emotionally balanced, trying to you know, allocate my time and energy. I, I give you an example, an example, list. I've been making a lot of lists on the best things ever this week, just having fun, preparing for this time together. So I was thinking about this. What are the best, uh, best inventions ever? The best or greatest inventions ever? I have my own short list. It's my list. It's subjective. I would say, number one, the wheel. The wheel was a big invention. Uh, number two, the uh, taming of fire. Fire was a big invention. I would say, number three, whoever put those little tiny wheels on the suitcases great invention number three that's where it is because some of y'all like me you're old enough to remember back before they had those wheels anybody come on old people yes yes and the funny thing was if, if you don't remember back in the day you'd have this suitcase and maybe the weight limit for the airline was 50 pounds so your wife would put that on the bathroom scale and put 49 pounds and 15 ounces worth of stuff in there and you didn't have the wheels, so you had to try to muscle that with one hand. I don't care how jacked you were, like this brother, jacked like this brother, right? Oh, it was just, just. But the funny thing was, if you actually had two suitcases that weighed 49 pounds, it was almost easier to lift, but the balance made the load easier to bear. You need to be balanced. And how are you balanced? Well, I guess I should devote the same amount of time to everything that's important. No, of course not. You're going to spend more time sleeping than praying. I spend more time sleeping than praying. Don't judge me. You do too, right? Uh, you're going to spend more time at work than you will in a worship service. That's okay. I think the key to balance is not, is not about how much time goes to everything. That, that, that matters. I think it's more about putting first things first. First things first. What's the key verse on this? You stay in Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter uh, 3. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, something Jesus said. It's really good. Let's read together. It's on the screen. Bam, right now. But seek God's kingdom and God's righteousness and all these things. What are all these things? Those things you stress over. Oh, my finances, my career. I gotta spend more time with the wife. Oh, time with the kids. I need some me time, all right? All, he'll take care of all those things if you put God first. Because you need to be balanced. So that's a simple sermon. Go out there and be balanced. Be balanced, be balanced, be balanced in everything. Except, I was thinking about this dude, John, greatest guy ever. He wasn't balanced. In fact, here's the crazy thing about this guy that Jesus said was the greatest ever. Uh, he's kind of crazy. Anybody ever read the story of John? He's a little weird. He's a little different. He's a little extreme. So I'm going to give a caveat. Here's, a, here's an asterisk. If you want to be successful, impactful, great, the best you can be, be balanced on most things. But on a few God things, be crazy. It's cool to be crazy. It's okay to be crazy. Oh, if you're watching on TV, I got about a third of the people clapping. The other people are like, I'm not even sure I can clap at that. Let me stop right now. I'm not talking about mental health right now. There's someone going to think, man, I need to be crazy for God and, and not take my medication and have faith. No, 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 no. You love Jesus, but please stay on your meds. <laughs> for Jesus' sake and the rest of us, stay on your meds. But I was thinking about the story of John. I, in some ways, he was crazy. Like, just write these down. I mean, three quick Crazy ideas. Number one, John was a crazy su uh, surprise, a crazy surprise. His parents couldn't have kids. His dad's name is Zachariah. His mom is Eliz Elizabeth. Zachariah is a priest. He's a priest. He works as a priest. He's in the ministry. When I say three, shout the word priest. One, two, three. Priest. 
And one day he's in the temple in Jerusalem doing his priestly ministry. He has a vision of an angel. The angel says, Zachariah, you're going to be a dad. Now he's shocked because it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 7, that he and his wife are both very old beyond the years of having children. They have no kids, and so bam, you're gonna have a, have a child. I don't even know what that even means, uh, but obviously she's postmenopausal and he can't have kids, so I don't know, Viagra's not invented yet, so something, and he just, so. But they've been praying for a child. I love when people pray for the, the impossible, and so they have a child. They're, they're old. She might be 70 or 80. She may have had her AARP card for 25 years. You know what I learned from that? You're never too old for God. I, I don't care if you're here and you've been retired for a decade and a half. You are never too old for God to use you. God didn't get started with Moses until Moses was 80 years young. I learned from this. You're never too old and you're never too young and you're not too screwed up for God to use you. All right? Crazy surprise. I wrote this down quickly that John demonstrates crazy dedication, crazy dedication. I've just found in life that crazy success flows typically from crazy sacrifice. Again, be balanced in most areas. I'm not giving you license if you're a workaholic to spend all your time in the office at the expense of your family. But if God has called you clearly to do something. Well, that's something you need to be a little crazy. You need to be a little extreme. You need to be crazy dedicated, crazy purposeful, crazy persistent, crazy passionate. Let me show you John's ministry. We're finally in Matthew chapter, uh, chapter, you guys are good, Matthew chapter three. It just briefly describes the ministry of John, the forerunner of Messiah. It says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Let me jump ahead of verse. John's clothes were weird. Uh, he, had, he wore clothes made of camel's hair, really rough and out of style. Uh, he had a leather belt around his waist. His food, weirder than his clothes. He ate locusts and wild honey. Uh, people went out to hear him from all over Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region, and they were being bad. Listen, here's a crazy thing. His church was in a tough spot. Your average preacher couldn't pull off his church. See, his church was not in the capital city, Jerusalem. In fact, it wasn't in the city. It wasn't in the burbs. His church wasn't even in the country. His church was out in the desert. His calling of ministry was tough. He wore tough clothes, had a tough diet, had a tough ministry. But God's hand was on him, and the multitudes came. They walked. They rode the camels. They got crowded, by the way. Crowds are biblical. I love our churches crowded. When you're stuck in the parking lot for 20 minutes, don't you get mad. Give glory to God because God is moving. They didn't have enough parking spaces for the family camels, but because he was so dedicated, God was showing up. People were showing up. People were getting saved, coming to God. Crazy stuff happening. But I'm just telling you, if God has called you to do something, it's not your idea. It's God's thing. Be crazy. Work at it crazy hard. Be crazy persistent. Watch what God will do. So of all the movies we're going to tackle, there's probably more excitement for the movie next week because next week it's, it's Harry Potter weekend at all of our campuses at CBG. Any fans of Harry Potter? You guys are kind of quiet, man. You're the quietest crowd thus far. Yeah, the movies are extraordinary. The books are great. Uh, I got people coming. I heard a story about a family who's never been here before. They're driving in from Palm Beach County uh, because they love the movie. They don't care about church. They love the movie. I... I someone changing flight plans to be here for the movie or for the weekend. Uh, who was the author of the Harry Potter books? Yeah, you know her name, J.K. Rowling. You know the story of how, when she wrote the first book, the challenges she faced? She had just gone through a divorce. She had very little money. She was worried about feeding her child. She couldn't afford a computer, so she typed out the manuscript for the first book on an old-school manual typewriter. On top of that, she didn't have money for photocopies. So she had to type multiple copies of the 90,000-word book and send those off to different publishers, rejected dozens and dozens of times, and it was a second time around to a small London publisher. And the publisher didn't like the book, but his 8-year-old daughter read it. She liked the book. That's the only reason why Harry Potter made it to a publisher, made it into book form, and made it to the movies. Somebody crazy dedicated. Crazy success flows from crazy sacrifice. John, crazy dedication, crazy surprise in who God uses. Third and finally, he's crazy secure. I meet more people who have, they're, they're talented and they're smart, they're just so supremely insecure. 
They self-sabotage or they try to hide the insecurity with, with pride and arrogance, but it's this thin facade. They're so insecure. Be secure with the person God has created you to be. And listen, that's hard to do. Because this world's trying to squeeze you into this mold all the time. You got all these people around you, especially young people. I talk to the old people in a month, you're not too old. Let me talk to the young people. If you're 20 or in your teens, or you're in high school or middle school, I mean, I get it, man. The pressure on you is so extreme. You got peers and friends, they're trying to tell you what, how to dress and what to say and what stupid choices to make. Don't conform. You be confident, you be secure. Don't you conform. I showed you the best verse on transformation in the Bible last week, Romans 12, verse 2. It's on the screen right now. It talks about how God wants to grow us and transform us by leveraging our decisions. But look what it says first. Before God can change you, you got to make a stand. Read loudly. Do not any longer to the pattern of this world. Because all these friends have their expectations of what you should do and what you should say and how you should dress and how you should believe. And guess what? They're stupider than you. They are so jacked up. They will mess you up. And God has called you to a higher standard. God has called you to give your life, not to something mundane, average, go with the flow. He wants you to be great. He wants you to be the best. So you can't cave in. So your friends have expectations. Your culture has all this pressure puts on you. Even, listen, even parents. Even, man, I, I'm a dad, and I don't mean to, but sometimes I superimpose my expectations upon my kids. And, I need to take a step back and let my kids be who God has made my kids to be. That's tough, man. This story, I feel bad for John's daddy. Poor Zachariah. I mean, it's amazing and miraculous as an old man, he's going to have a baby. But I'm just thinking through his, his, you know, his mindset when he hears in that, that Luke 1 prophecy from the angel in the temple, because he says, not only will you have a baby, but he's going to be a great man of God. He's going to bring joy and delight to your heart. He's going to bring multitudes back to the living God from Israel. And no doubt that daddy's assumption, Zachariah was thinking, wow, my boy's going to be a great man of God. Well, uh, I'm a priest. He'll no doubt be a priest. My father was a priest. My grandfather was a priest. He comes along, he'll be a priest. I wear beautiful robes. and I do ministry in the temple here in Jerusalem. He's going to no doubt wear beautiful priestly robes and, and do ministry here in the temple with me. His boy grows up, lives in the desert, dresses with weird clothes, and eats bugs. You thought your kid was bad. Your kid doesn't eat bugs. But guess what? Everything the angel said about John came to pass. And he was the first prophetic voice in a 400-year void, man. He spoke into the hearts of his countrymen. He changed his generation. Why? He didn't conform. He only conformed to the calling of his God. So young person, I get it. You're not what your parents expected. You're not what your friends have accepted. You're not what your culture has reflected. But you are the person that God has created to impact your generation. So don't you cave in. Don't you conform. Settle for nothing less than being great. So John, John was weird, man. If you're weird, you're in good company. If you were, John was this weird dude, but man, he was all, it's all about God's calling on his life, and that made him secure. See, security doesn't come from approval of other people. It comes from alignment with God's calling on your life. And so he was just being true to God's calling on his life, and he was secure. And, and even later on, John's Gospel, chapter 3, the crowd leaves John. There's a time, his church was the big church, the, the exciting church, the cool church. After a while, they leave his church, they go to a church of this new guy named Jesus. And John had, you know, followers and disciples, and John's disciples said, hey, hey, John, what's up with this? That guy, Jesus, that you baptized, everyone's going to his church. They're leaving us, they're going to him. And by the way, now they're baptizing people. That was our thing. We came up with that. And John is so cool. He says, awesome. Weren't you paying attention? I, I came to get them ready for him. I'm not the Messiah. He's the Messiah. He must increase. Okay, if I decrease. I pray that Jesus gets big and I get small. I pray that all the attention goes to him and not me. I am the forerunner of the Christ. You think that's crazy? It's crazy. There's someone in here, you've never given your heart to Christ. I know there are cars at the front of the stage, but also when I say amen in like 90 seconds, there'll be nice folks here. They'll help you navigate your salvation decision. At every campus, it's the same way. You can give your heart to Christ today. Oh my gosh, I don't know about that. Yes, you need to make this decision. And for you Christians that are kind of playing the game of compromise, you need to be all in. This is not an area you want to be balanced. Uh, God, I'll give you a little slice of my Sunday and live the rest of my life. No, 
all in, all in, all in to the point where your old friend's like, what's happening to you, bro? What's that? You're so into this God thing. You're so plugged into your church. You're, I don't even recognize you, man. You won't drink with us anymore. You won't drug with us. You're not sleeping around anymore. You're, you're serving at your church. You're volunteering. You're giving money to your church. Did you join a cult? You joined cult by the glaze, didn't you? Joined cult by the glaze. Look, look, you, you're just going a little crazy with this. You're going a little crazy. Take a step back. Keep in perspective. You've gone crazy for this God stuff. You just say, yeah, I'm sorry. It's true. I have gone crazy for a God that loves me like crazy. I'm crazy. And all the best people are. Let me pray for you. Father God, I pray for some Christians that will not compromise and compartmentalize, that give you a little sliver of their Sunday and feel like that's all God wants. God, you are a consuming fire. So Father, light us on fire. Consume every part of us. Help us be passionate. Help us be persistent. Help us be crazy for our God. The best people are. We make this prayer in Jesus' name.